And welcome everybody, I'm Rob Pavarian and this is CK3 Dev Diary number 64. Today we're here to talk about cultures and I am so excited because this is a fat Dev Diary. It's truly massive, it's truly large and most importantly, this is mentioned at the end of the Dev Diary, everything talked about in this Dev Diary, the entire culture rework will be free. It will be a part of the free patch that comes with the Royal Court DLC and I'm a huge fan because while, you know, the Royal Courts of the 3D environment and that sort of stuff is a bit on top of, you know, what the game mechanics are, this one is a fundamental, a basic game mechanic and it being fleshed out like this and it being fleshed out basically for everybody because you don't need to pay anything for it is the best news that I have seen when it comes to the culture rework as a whole. But let me tell you, the culture rework as a whole is massive to begin with. Now I want to inform you before we jump into the dev diary that today at 8pm CEST, so Central European Summertime, there will be a teaser going live on the channel for a project that I have been working on with many many other people and a project that will be occurring in the future. It's just a teaser so more information is of course to follow. But I hope that you will enjoy the teaser and I hope that you will enjoy and get excited for the project just as much as I am excited for it. Now let's take a look at what we have here. The patch is still being worked on so they're currently working on something that you know will iron out some of the issues that 1.4 introduced. Um, but if everything goes as planned we should, uh, should be able to get it out sometime next week or so. We'll let you know once the patch is ready. Now let's talk about cultures. Unlike FaZe which got, uh, which got a lot of attention prior to release as we made them quite dynamic and customizable, cultures can feel a bit static and aren't anywhere near as interesting as fates. That is of course true. Now cultures did solve an issue even as they are right now in CK3 because they approach, uh, approached basically everything related to innovations and technology. In CK2, honestly the CK2 system was utterly horrendous. It was awful and that is no longer the case in CK3. I think it did solve that issue but the underlying issue of culture being you know quite static and Basically, you just take somewhere over. I mean, anybody that has played in Iberia will know it. If you play the Andalusians and you go north, you know, you want to fight, for example, you want to take over the uh, Castilian territories, then you will have so many peasant rebellions, you can't really do much about it, even if you put a ruler of theirs in their place. And then we're looking at a situation where they will constantly be rebelling and... Uh, you know, it's, it's just annoying until you basically culture them away by culture converting them. That will no longer be the case. You have many more options now and that is something that I have been dearly missing as much as, you know, the new culture system in CK3 solved the tech issue of uh, CK2. There were many, many underlying issues as well. We are revisiting cultures as you know them. Most exciting is perhaps the possibility to create new cultures, both for simulating historical events and to create plausible and interesting alt history, uh, alt history scenarios. But I'm getting ahead of myself. But now let's uh, start by looking at the foundation of a culture and the different components they are made of. This is what the new culture screen will look like. So here we have the Rashput culture, so in India, uh, in the Indian subcontinent. We have traditional pillars, then we have the innovations that we know. Currently we are obviously in the early medieval period, but as you can see this is the new screen. So if you switch right here you will see the innovations as we know them and right here we got the traditions and pillars. So this is the ethos of the culture. It is bellicose, so it uh, is a result of, you know, uh, their material existence basically. What have they experienced? What are they experiencing and they have become a bit of a warrior culture I would say. Then we have the cultural pillars that are somewhat connected to the culture groups as they existed in CK2 uh, in CK3 and CK2 but now they go a lot further. So this is the Indo-Aryan uh, Aryan heritage which basically just puts them into their culture group. Then we have the Rajasthani language so language will play a, uh, play a role. It is interesting to see as well that this is Rajasthani language so we can probably see a rough you know idea of what the languages will look like in how detailed they will be and so on. Then we got Marshall Min only. So this is something similar to a religious doctrine, but this one only navigates you when it comes to who can become a commander, who can become a knight, who can become a shield maiden, and so on. Then we have the Rashput aesthetics. That essentially is just, hey, you know, what is up with, uh, what clothes do we wear, what sort of buildings do we get in terms of, you know, what do they look like, uh, what are our naming schemes, what is our uh, coat of arms schemes, and so on and so forth. Quite interesting, these cultural pillars that basically root you into who you are. This is what you were made into because of the environment that you are living in as a culture. And then we got traditions, which is just an extension, I would call it at the very least, of the ethos. Uh, we got the warrior culture right here, we got quarrelsome, we got mystical ancestors, and we got Katka Puja, uh, which I am not entirely sure. Is this like a caste idea, or is this something that is more related to... Uh, just specific warrior orders maybe. Maybe if some, one of you can explain it in the comments, I would be a big fan. What is noticeable here 
is that you can see very different frames. So this is just for one culture, right? But all of these frames clearly differ to a significant degree. I'm not entirely sure what they, you know, uh, what they signify. Maybe there's just uh, certain groups that you can have in traditions that you can choose from, and maybe that is what determines the frame, but I'm not entirely certain. And here you can see the button for established traditions. Uh, we're gonna get to that in a second. Currently we have four out of six. If we had the prestige, then we could establish a new one. Now let's go into it in detail. The cultural pillars are ethos, heritage, language, martial custom, and finally aesthetic. We already uh, took a look at that here. Let's talk about the ethos. A culture's ethos not only provides effects and bonuses for having it, it also ties into how easy or difficult it is to acquire certain traditions. More on this further down. There are seven in total. It makes sense, of course. If you are bellicose, then it will be easier to become a warrior culture because you're already primed for it, right? Uh, we have bellicose, communal, courtly, and I gotta turn that off, egalitarian, inventive, spiritual, and stoic. Here are a few examples of what they look like in game. So we got bellicose, uh, you get cheaper, or oh, you get more mercenary companies actually, then you get all cumin characters. Pr uh, so this is a, a cumin overview here basically of the cumins. We got prowess, we got minute arms recruitment cost and maintenance down, and then the holdings, the levy size increases quite sizably, plus 10% is rather large. This culture considers conflict and violence to be necessary states of existence. Ingrained in its people is the idea that one should stand up and fight for their own. Then down here we got spiritual, this is for the Mashriki characters. Um, monthly piety goes up, control growth goes up, oh wow, that is uh, quite significant, honestly. And then faith creation and reformation cost minus 20%. It is interesting, of course, how the modifiers impact the same thing to a certain degree. We got the levy size up at all times for bellicose cultures, but then spiritual, uh, the control growth will, of course, also increase how many uh, troops are available, so indirectly this also impacts the level uh, levy availability. Then right here we got inventive, all Anglo-Saxon characters, so this the, the Anglo-Saxons will be inventive. Monthly lifestyle experience plus 5%, cultural fascination progress plus 15% and all of the counties get increased development growth right there. Uh, let's just take a look at the flavor text of spiritual. I skipped that by accident. While well, some cultures can turn to warn others to worldly knowledge, this culture places its trust in the only constant throughout its history, the divine. Spirituality is the only way forward in a harsh and uncaring world. Then down here we have always curious and never complacent. This culture is quick to embrace new ways of thinking or adopt new technologies that others would scoff at. Very interesting. Now, I have seen a concern, and I want to bring that up, of course. If you go into cultures, and if you analyze what they are, if you, you know, go into it, you will quickly notice it's really difficult to analyze what they are, to, you know, quantify that, to put that into modifiers, to put that into something like spiritual or bellicose or inventive, and to a certain degree, you cannot avoid stereotyping a culture. That's just the way it is. However, um, and this comes up with an issue that I don't think this system covers, but should cover, in my opinion. I just want to bring it up. I'm not sure whether it is covered. It's not mentioned here. Um, when we're looking at these ethoses, or ethi, honestly, I, I'm not entirely certain. But what I mean is, when we look at them, I don't think that this says, naturally, if you are born, you will automatically be like this. This is nothing like that sort of stereotyping. Instead, this depicts what this culture has experienced in recent centuries, and because of that, how they behave. Uh, it is very interesting to see, for example, with the Magyars that migrated into the Pannonian basis, uh, Basin to then form Hung Hungary after they lost the Battle of Lechfeld, where most of their warrior class failed. And, you know, was destroyed. They, they basically died there. Much of their warriors died there. Um, they basically, if we want to put it into these terms, uh, lost the bellicose trade. Because the Hungarians, uh, at that point, you know, settled down. They had a sort of reaction to that. Of course, their society wasn't the same now that the warrior class was basically eliminated. Uh, I don't know what, you know, would fit there. Maybe stoic, maybe communal. Communal could be a good one. Uh, maybe even egalitarian, depending on how the new society organizes themselves. And uh, that is essentially how I view this. I don't think that if you start as, for example, inventive, that you should always be inventive. And I don't think, from what I can see here, this system addresses this yet, but I want to bring this up. Um, we know about how hybridization, where one culture moves into the area of a different culture and they form a new culture. We know about divergence, where one culture moves away from their home territory and then becomes different from the culture that remains in the home territory. So, for example, the Magyars in the steppes are different from the Magyars that move to the Pannonian Basin, right? Um, the way I see this, I really hope that even if you don't utilize divergence or uh, hybridization, because it might not be appropriate, that depending on the circumstances, the ethos can still change. What I mean is, for example, if the Anglo-Saxons are inventive, but then for 400 years, let's say, you know, maybe 300 years, 200 years, whatever, even 100 years honestly would be enough as far as I'm concerned, if they get terrorized by Viking invaders time and time and time again, would they truly remain inventive or would their culture change to be something more bellicose? Because all they know is warfare. 
If the French, for example, you know, are courtly, let's assume they are courtly, they value the courtly values a lot. Um, if they are that, but are constantly in a position where they are poor, they can't afford to be courtly, they might switch to inventive, they might switch to stoic, and so on and so forth. So what I'm saying is, I really, really hope that culture shifting, even without forming a new culture to a in any way, I hope that that can still happen, because I think it is wrong to say that a culture in 867 still has the same ethos necessarily, as, you know, a culture that is the same culture, but in 1453. These things can change rapidly. Just think of Iberia, think of the Castilians. Uh, they became, as they went on, a bit more bellicose. You know, they were they were used to this life uh, constantly opposing one another, so the Castilians uh, infighting, but also opposing the Taifas, for example, that were created after the Umayyads fell. So my point basically here is, I wish that Castilians could maybe, if they become rich after they, you know, if they were to win the Reconquista, they could become courtly, for example. That is something that I uh, that is on my mind. I don't think this stereotypes it, but I think it should be flexible. It ought to be flexible if major events happen. If you haven't gone to war in a hundred years, you shouldn't be warlike. That, you know, that, that's just the way I see it. Now let's take a look at heritage, because that is, of course, uh, the next thing here, basically. The cultural pillars. Um, let's check it out. A culture's heritage can be compared to the culture groups that you may be used to in the existing system. Heritages will roughly match set culture groups. You'll see an Iberian heritage for cultures like Basque and Castilian, or Turkic heritage for Turkic cultures such as Ogos and Cuman. In terms of gameplay, the most outstanding effect of a shared heritage is the impact it has on cultural acceptance. Now, there is language in uh, as a part of heritage. Languages, languages vary greatly across the map and between cultures. Some languages, such as Arabic, are spoken by quite a few cultures. Other languages are spoken by no more than two or three cultures, or in some cases, cultures even have their own unique language. An example for that is, for example, Basque, of course, they are the only ones that speak it. The vast majority of cultures share a language, though, uh, as a sort of language group rather than a specific language. Cult uh, characters can always speak... Wait a minute. A language, though, as a sort of language group. Uh, that is an interesting point as well, right? We're looking at something where um, German exists, but Bavarians speak different German from people in Saxony, for example. You know, in, in Angen. In, I, I'm talking about the, the uh, what, what is Niedersachsen in the modern day. I wish that that had an impact, but I don't think it is modeled here, because while they do say it's basically a language group, for example, a lot of people will, will speak uh, Arabic, right? Uh, we're looking at a situation where we probably will just see German language instead of Bavarian language and Saxon language, and then those are unified in the German language group. Rather, it would likely be German language, and then, you know, let's say Norwegian, for example, and they are in the Germanic language family. At least, that is how I assume they do it. I wish, uh, you know, languages could develop, as well, it would be quite a lot of fun, I think, if we are looking at, for example, me diverging. You know, if I uh, am a Magyar and I move to, let's say, uh, North Africa, I move to, tu uh, to Tunisia, we're looking at a situation where I am very unlikely to still speak the same language as the Magyars in the steppe, right? Uh, it would be cool if I could have a mix rather than just either sticking with Magyar or adopting uh, Tunisian or Arabic in this case. Uh, so the way I look at it is uh, if we could have a sort of feature that lets us mishmash languages and lets us be compatible to either and incompatible to everything else, of course, I think that would also be quite nice. I don't think this uh, system has this feature, but also this is a bit like the cherry on top that I'm demanding here, you know? I'm looking at it as, hey, we could make it even better, right? But as it is, I'm already very happy that we got cultures in the game to begin with because it's the very first time for a grand strategy game. Characters can always speak the associated language of their culture, of course, that is what you grow up with. Knowing multiple languages languages has its benefits, as speaking the same language as another character of a different culture and county will reduce the opinion penalty that character or county has towards you. It makes sense. If I can go to the peasants in a county and talk to them, I can benefit from the fact that, you know, I can talk to them. They will like it, they will say, hey, this ruler is close to us, uh, we shouldn't rebel against him, and it might have a, you know, positive impact. Knowing the native language, for example, the language of their culture, of your vassals is therefore fairly beneficial as a means of increasing their opinion of you. This is massive. Um, until now, basically impossible. Until now, this entire section is basically impossible in gameplay terms. It is so static in gameplay terms, cultures just don't like you, they're just unhappy if you're there, they will always and always and always rise up. Uh, you know, uh, even rulers will always disrespect you unless you go and say, hey, here's infinite money. But, but you can't really do anything about respecting their culture. I think there's an event that basically talks about, hey, you know, uh, do you want to say I respect this other guy's culture? And then you can say yes, but... It has no lasting impact. Learning a language, on the other hand, very, very cool. 
I am looking forward to learning more about this for sure. Now let's talk about the uh, Noble Marshal Custom. The Marshal Custom decides which gender you may appoint as knights and commanders. We always felt that having the gender doctrine on face decide which characters can and cannot participate in battles felt off. The doctrine is about the right to rule and the holding of titles more so than anything else. Just because you want the equal doctrine to allow female rulers doesn't mean that women would automatically lead your armies or join you as knights. This is pretty cool. Gives us more granularity, gives us more modularity, makes it so that we have more choices. I'm very much a big fan of this. No negative uh, points or no additions from my side here. Aesthetics. This uh, pillar is really a collection of several smaller properties for what a culture looks like. It decides what type of clothes characters wear, the coats of arms style for dynasties, what architecture holdings use, and the type of armor the units on the map wear. It also does naming practices and so on. Dynasty prefixes. Good, good change. This means that I can have a true hybrid culture as well. Of course, uh, the ethnicity that I arrive with will remain the same until I marry into the local populace. Uh, but, you know, for when it comes to the clothing, I can keep either the old clothing or adopt newer clothing. Uh, here as well, I will say it, I think this is a great change. Nothing wrong with this at all. But I do think, you know, it, it would be cool if I could mix and match. If I could say we wear both clothing sets. We go both, you know, for example, I invaded Rajasthan, we both wear Rajasthani clothing, but also Norse clothing. I think would be kind of cool. Uh, yet again, I don't think it is covered here, but honestly, I'll be honest with you, uh, I, I feel like I have luxury complaints. I still want to uh, word these complaints so that people are aware of how I feel about it and why I feel about it this way. But I also think, uh, again, this culture rework is absolutely outstanding. Uh, for all you modders out there, all of these can be set individually per culture, so there you go. You can at least, on a modding level, you can change this sort of stuff individually, allowing you to mix and match the different aesthetics to your heart's content. <sighs> and now in vanilla, please? Paradox? <laughs> now let's get to traditions. Traditions are the meat of the cultural overhaul and provide that extra layer of variety and immersion that can have a significant impact on gameplay. An important aspect of traditions is that they give us a clear means of visualizing and explaining existing mechanics that previously just were a thing and never explained. Take Anglo-Saxon as an example. They have access to the Saxon elective succession for no apparent reason other than they do, similar to the Celts having Tanistry and similar to the Norse having Scandinavian elective. Instead, now they have a tradition that grants in the succession law, making it clear as to why they have it. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, traditions serve as the perfect means of giving cultural, uh, culture additional flavor or gameplay bonuses that add a great degree of variety across the map. A culture can have no more than five traditions in total, but this number will increase as you enter a new era. So wait, we're talking about five at the start, then we got four eras, so we're talking about... Uh... It's actually a question. I assume tribal doesn't give you anything, so it, you would end up with eight, right? You, you have three more after tribal, and as you enter them, you get three more, meaning eight. Okay, that's pretty cool. That, that's a lot of variety here, there. That's a lot of uh, modularization there, where I can choose, you know, what I want and what I what I want to pick. Um, most cultures will start the game with around three or four, which leaves plenty of room for you to shape your culture as you play the game. As the cultural head, you will have the ability to establish new traditions. Yeah, that's very cool. The cultural head becomes more important instead of just choosing innovations that are to be researched. Uh, we're looking at something where all of a sudden, you know, hey, this is quite nice. I will also add, by the way, and this is not mentioned in the dev diary because it is not uh, really necessary to mention it here, but wouldn't it be cool? If a culture shared a language with another culture, because right now it's just adjacency and uh, whether you share the same religion, for example, that can make it so that one of the innovations that you haven't focused are being focused by, uh, it's, it's called exposure, right? Exposure is randomly determined and it interacts basically, hey, this is sped up because we have the same religion. Wouldn't it be cool that if the Saxons knew about something, because I don't know, they interacted with the Norse, for example, all of a sudden the Bavarians could hear of it and could learn from it and could grow into it much, much faster because we share a language. Whereas otherwise, even if we border, even if we share the same religion, the exchange and the exposure isn't as fast. I hope that this has an impact on it because it would be so cool. The more interconnected all of this is, the happier I will be, basically. Um, where were we? Not all traditions will be available everywhere. We have both regi uh, regional traditions as well as traditions that are available depending on your heritage. So this is basically much like innovations. Um, it might require certain conditions, such as hill dwellers having the requirement that your culture must be present in a county with hills. That is quite neat. Of course, it responds not directly to, oh, these cultures just naturally are like this. No, no, no. It responds naturally to how your culture is, what they are experiencing, and what their everyday life looks like, much like what I explained above uh, above with the ethos system. Um, here we go to traditions cost prestige to adopt, which will be the largest hurdle for you to overcome if you want a specific tradition. The prestige cost is dependent on your ethos. So, for example, a bellicose culture gets a lower prestige cost for the tradition of warrior uh, classes. 
Certain traditions will be more expensive than others if you don't have a matching ethos. Similarly, a tradition will increase in cost if your culture, or in some cases the cultural head, does not fulfill a specific and thematic requirement. An example would be, uh, for example, only the strong, which is more expensive if you as the cultural head do not have at least six knights with at least 12 prowess. Yeah, obviously. If you're the cultural head, if you rule over these cultural lands and if this is your culture, this will only cement within your culture if you are living it. Again, this is the theme of this entire thing, basically, that your culture will be the way that it is living. Um, in this case, you know, you need to have six individuals that are your knights and have at least 12 prowess to then uh, have a very cheap only the strong. You could still get it because they don't want you uh, to be entirely locked out. They want to soft lock you, basically, to not get this unless you f uh, fulfill the requirements. But yeah, most of the time this is definitely roleplay incentivizing while not locking you out if you don't want to roleplay, which is, I think, a decent approach. Now let's take a look at some traditions here. Swords for Hire, um, is this like the, the Sassanid flag right here? I, I can't tell. Uh, Swords for Hire, Wanderers gain extra combat skills over time, such as Martial Prowess or Commander Traits, that is amazing. Knights and Mercenary Courts rapidly gain prowess, very good. Idle Courtiers, so this just means you want to basically... Uh, higher mercenary orders because they will come with better knights but you can also just you know hey if you make a friend of a knight in a mercenary court you can then have them in your court you don't even need to hire the mercenaries to begin with idle courtiers are much more likely to become wanderers yeah of course they want to uh, gain glory somewhere else then right here we have the available mercenary companies plus 50 percent and all breton characters so this is something the bretons have same culture mercenary higher cost minus 15 percent this culture views mercenary work favorably and encourages warriors to seek glorious mercenaries in between wars very very cool uh, chivalry. Who's this? This is the Duke of... I want to say... Is this Champagne? I can't tell. It can't be France, right? Because France has a French king who would be the cultural head. Is this Occitan? Maybe. Did they split another area off? I'm not sure what this is. I don't think it mentions it in here. Chivalry. Can spar against own knights in single combat to gain modifiers. Successfully executing a Roman scheme gives renown. Wow. Bailing Ro a Roman scheme gives stress. Of course, if you execute, uh, execute a Roman scheme, you get renown because that is a, a tale that a chivalric culture or somebody with that tradition will celebrate. The bards will sing about your exploits and your arrival as a valiant knight, you know, who uh, found his maid and, you know, got away with her, I guess. Uh, failing a Roman scheme gives stress, of course. You're failing to be what your culture expects from you. And then rulers are more likely to start the Roman scheme. The poet and gallant... This, this will make people happy, I guarantee it. Everybody's going to be cheating. Uh, the poet and gallant trades give significant Roman scheme bonuses. Oh, this these are the French. Sorry, these are the French. Uh, so... I wonder why he is the, the head of the French. Anyway, tyranny gain plus 50%, knight effectiveness plus 20%. This culture has embraced chivalry and chivalric codes of conduct as a social method of regulating behavior. That's a perfect description. That is exactly what I wanted to uh, get at there with the cultural expectations. Martial prowess, duty, honor, and morality are prized, as is bad poetry and romantic literature. A big question here for me is, um, not just when it comes to the ethos, I brought that up earlier, I, I went into that uh, at length, but how will the AI react when it comes to removing traditions. I assume they won't really do it. Can you remove traditions? Because at some point there may be a swing, a mood swing, you know, if for example the uh, your knights come back from the Holy Land, they're all disgruntled, they're all disillusioned with knighthood, chivalry may be dying out. That would be an interesting concept. I don't think it will be a part, though. I, I don't know whether you even can remove traditions, I'll be honest with you. Esteemed hospitality, uh, because at the end of the day, and I want to make that clear as well, as much as I think that would be great for roleplay, Losing things isn't a fun game mechanic. Uh, I, I think exchanging would be more likely, right? But I don't I don't know whether you can even exchange. Maybe cultures only go up, basically, where they only gain traditions rather than exchange them. But we'll see about that. We, we don't have the details, is basically what I'm saying. Esteemed hospitality, rulers are less likely to have ca uh, courtiers and guests join hostile schemes against them. Guest re recruitment costs minus 20%. This is for Baloch characters, I believe, in the Indian subcontinent, right? Courtier and guest opinion plus 10, and personal scheme and su uh, success chance plus 5%. In this culture, rulers are known and expected to welcome anyone who might come to the court with open arms, hosting guests and visitors in a spectacular fashion. And then seafarers, of course. The trade port line of buildings will increase control growth in counties of this culture. Man, trade port is already such a good building. Having that increased control growth is so good. The trade port line of buildings increases levies in counties of this culture. Yeah, that is that is crazy good. Unlocks the ability to sail in major rivers. Very cool. So this is no longer locked. This is no longer locked. Does that mean... Oh my god, does that mean that cultural innovations that... Uh, maybe regional or culture group specific, like for example the ability to, the longboat ability for the Norse characters, does that mean that they can potentially go and have that as a tradition instead? 
Circumventing innovations? That would be very cool. Uh, embarkation cost minus 25% and naval speed plus 20. For this culture, the core of the sea is too strong to resist and they live to sail like a dream on a crystal clear ocean or ride on the crest of a wild raging storm. And then last but not least, Land of the Bow can recruit Nile archers as men-at-arms. This is uh, for the Nubians. The hunting grounds line of buildings will improve archers. Very cool. And the land of plenty, enriched by the Nile and their own. So this must be a... This must be a regional tradition. You can get this if you are at the Nile. I think this is a general tradition. A general tradition. Maybe culture group specific? There's no difference here, no differentiation in culture traditions anyway. But this certainly is a, is a regional tradition. The hunting grounds, line of buildings, right. In the land of plenty enriched by the Nile and their own ingen ingenuity, the Nubian have prospered for generations. For almost as long, the bow has been the weapon of choice to deter the raiders and brigands of the surrounding deserts. Very cool. Very, very cool stuff. I'm, I'm a huge fan of this, for sure. The fact that this has moved into traditions rather than into uh, innovations is, is excellent. I hope, honestly, that longboats are just completely taken out of the innovations and moved into the tradition systems because... It's not really an innovation. It's a tradition that establishes itself, right? Cultural acceptance. Cultural acceptance can be described as how well intermingled two cultures are and how accepting they are of each other, which means that given enough time, cultures will dislike each other less and a culture converting everything within your realm is no longer the only solution to combat cultural differences. Thank you. I hated it. I'm a huge fan of this. The opinion penalty of being a different culture used to be a static value. Now it will depend on the cultural acceptance between your culture and the target culture. Oh, and let me... Yeah, my bad. I didn't have it full screen the entire time. Uh, the target culture. Each culture has an acceptance value of another culture, visualized as a percentage. A percentage. At 0% acceptance, you'll have the full opinion penalty. At 100%, the penalty is removed altogether. Acceptance goes both ways. So if the French have 20% acceptance towards Normans, it will also be the same the other way around. The first is an acceptance baseline. So this is a... There are two ways for acceptance to change. The first is an acceptance baseline, which increases of two cultures share similarities with one another. There are a number of different modifiers that can increase the baseline. So for example, of course, Bavarians will feel closer to Saxons because they speak the same language compared to the Muggers, the Czech and the Polish. Uh, for example, uh, where's the other one? Such as cultures that share the same religion or faith, uh, or faith, ethos, or language. The most impactful modifier, however, is heritage. If two cultures share the same heritage, they have a significant bonus to their baseline. Of course, that also increases it because, yeah, you, you come basically from the same thing. Maybe you have even the same origin myth. We have the situation with the Slavs, for example, where the three brothers, uh, Lek, Czech, and Rus, I believe those were the names, um, are actually in a position where you can trace yourself, or where you desire to trace yourself to the same heritage that will bind you together much, much more than it would, for example, with the French. Um, if acceptance is above the baseline, it will slowly decay over time towards the targeted value. Being below the baseline, on the other hand, will not make the acceptance increase. A bad relation between cultures won't disappear overnight. So you do want a high baseline because it guarantees that you will always be there unless things go wrong, but if you're below the baseline, you won't get any aid because you're below the baseline for a reason. For example, you know, if uh, the French and the English are constantly at war, you can assume that the baseline won't save you. You will have really bad relations. It will be difficult to rule over these people. Because obviously, it will be difficult to interact with them as well, because you've been at war for generations. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Secondly, acceptance very much changes depending on the circumstances. Do not expect two cultures that never interact with one another to gain acceptance. If cultures exist within the same realm, though, it will increase over time. This applies to both counties of another culture within your realm, as well as vassals. Acceptance is also reactive. Taking certain actions towards characters of a different culture will have consequences on your acceptance, such as declaring war hmm, or revoking titles. This generally scales on size. While the difference isn't huge, revoking a single county from a small culture will, a county, a culture will decrease your acceptance more than if you would revoke a county from a much, much larger culture. At the end of the day, if you want to maintain a high acceptance and keep your Occitan vessels in France happy, you are at least gonna have to try and be nice to them. I'm a huge fan. I am a massive, massive fan of this. This is, this is great. This is amazing. I, basically everything I wanted. Um, when it comes to the cultural acceptance. Extremely cool. I hope this cultural acceptance has an impact on exposure for cultural innovations, but that is a different topic. I really do uh, hope it does, though. That, that would be very cool. And here we look at cultural acceptance 10%. Mu mutual acceptance between French and Bavarian. Uh, let's take a look at this. Bavarian culture. We are Stoic. Yeah, fair enough. Central Germanic heritage, of course. Oh, so you actually split Central Germanic and North Germanic and West Germanic, I guess. That's actually really neat. Martial, min only. Bavarian aesthetics and language we sadly don't see, but I have to assume it's just German, right? Ah, man, it would be great, though, if you had Bavarian and then Bavarian had a relationship to Saxon and together as a language family they have a relationship, you know, basically to everybody else. But who knows? We're gonna see how that goes. Um, 
Let's take a look at this. Yearly gain plus 0.14 intermingling in realm. I wonder where exactly this comes from for this case. You can even hover over it. Uh, maybe it's just because we are fairly close by. Maybe it is because we have a similar religion. Nope, that actually comes in here. I'm not sure then. Culture, uh, current acceptance is minus 5%, apparently. Uh, I guess because it's just so low. Acceptance baseline is plus 10, however. Culture shares a majority religion, plus 5. Oh no, it means... Uh, current acceptance, I think this refers to the higher the acceptance level already is, the lower or the higher the current acceptance will be a negative modifier. Because if you're already at 80, obviously it's harder to grow even fond of one another, while it's easy to grow fond if you don't know anything of, uh, of each other. Then acceptance baseline is determined by a share majority religion and a share a majority faith. There we go. That's what a culture will look like in the near future. And of course, all of this will be free. I'm a huge fan. You know what I'm also a fan of? Uh, what, do you, what do you look at this? What, what do you look at this? Bavarian? ends here. So this is a uh, Carantanian. Maybe Carantanian made it into the game. No, maybe Albanian made it into the game. Maybe the Crimean Goths made it into the game. I really hope so. I really, really hope so. Either way, this is an insane dev diary, as you will know, because this video is 30 minutes long. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you think about my first world complaints, basically. I, I still, I would love to see them. I'm very happy with what we are getting here in the free patch. But I gotta tell you, would be even cooler if it could be even more modular. <laughs> That's where I'm coming from. Now, with that being said, this is the end of the video. Make sure to not miss the premiere of the teaser later in the day at 8 p.m. CST. It will go live immediately at that time. I'm very excited. I hope so are you. You should have a good reason to be excited once you see it, I think. Uh, with that being said, I want to thank all the members of the channel. Thank you for being members. Thank you, uh, thank you for supporting me. Dear Barons, dear Counts, and dear Dukes. Love ya. And I'll see you later, alligator.